Hi, I'm Roshonda Cade. This is Reading with Roshonda. We are reading Our Nig by Harriet E. Wilson. We are on chapter five. I think last time when we read chapter four, I said it was chapter five, but today is chapter five. Um, the title of the chapter is Departures. Life is a strange avenue of various trees and flowers. Lightsome at commencement, but darkening to its end in a distant massy portal. It beginneth as a little path, edged with the violet and primrose, a little path of lawny grass and soft to tiny feet, soon spring thistles in the way, by Tupper. James' visit, conclude, James's visit concluded. Fredo had become greatly attached to him, and with sorrow she listened and joined in the farewells which preceded his exit. The remembrance of his kindness cheered her through many a weary month, and an occasional word to her in letters to Jack were like cold waters to a thirsty soul. Intelligence came that James would soon marry. Fredo hoped he would and removed her from Fredo hoped he would and remove her from such severe treatment as she was subject to. There had been additional burdens laid on her since his return. She must now milk the cows she had then only to drive. Flocks of sheep had been added to the farm, which daily claimed a portion of her time. In the absence of the men, she must harness the horse for Mary and her mother to ride, go to mill, in short, do the work of a boy, could one not be procured to endure the tirades of Mrs. Belmont. She was first up in the morning, doing what she could towards breakfast. Occasionally, she would utter some funny thing for Jack's benefit while she was waiting on the table, provoking a sharp look from his mother or expulsion from the room. On one such occasion, they found her on the roof of the barn. Some repairs having been necessary, a staging had been erected and was not wholly removed. Availing herself of ladder, she was mounted in high glee on the topmost board. Mr. Belmont called sternly for her to come down. Poor Jane nearly fainted from fear. Mrs. B. and Mary did not care if she broke her neck, while Jack and the men laughed at her fearlessness. Strange, one spark of playfulness could remain amid such constant toil. But her natural temperament was in a high degree mirthful, and the encouragement she received from Jack and the hired men constantly nurtured the inclination. When she had none of the family around to be merry with, she would amuse herself with the animals. Among the sheep was a willful leader who always persisted in being first served, and many times in his fury he had thrown down Nig till provoked she resolved to punish him. The pasture in which the sheep grazed was bounded on three sides by a wide stream, which flowed on one side at the base of precipitous banks. The first spare moments at her command, she ran to the pasture with a dish in her hand, and mounting the highest point of land nearest the stream, called the flock to meet her to called the flock to their mock repast. Sorry about that. Mr. Belmont with his laborers were in sight, though unseen by Fredo. They paused to see what she was about to do. Should she by any mishap lose her footing, she must roll into the stream and without aid must drown. They thought of shouting, but they feared an unexpected salute might startle her and thus ensure what they were anxious to prevent. They watched in breathless silence. The willful sheep came furiously leaping and bounding far in advance of the flock. Just as he leaped for the dish, she suddenly jumped one side when down he rolled into the river and swimming across remained alone till night. The men lay down, convulsed with laughter at the trick, and guessed at once its object. Mr. Belmont talked seriously to the child for exposing herself to such danger, but she hopped about on her toes and with laughable grimaces replied she knew she was quick enough to give him a slide. But to return. James married a Baltimorean lady of wealthy parentage. Baltimorean. I assume that means she's from Baltimore. James married a Baltimorean lady of wealthy parentage, an indispensable requisite his mother had always taught him. He did not marry her wealth, though. He loved her sincerely. She was not unlike his sister Jane, who had a social, gentle, loving nature, rather too yielding, her brother thought. His Susan had a firmness which Jane needed to complete her character, but which her ill health may in a measure have failed to produce. Although an invalid, she was not excluded from society. Was it strange she should seem a desirable companion, a treasure as a wife? Hmm. Two young men seemed desirous of possessing her. One was a neighbor, Henry Reed, a tall, spare young man with sandy hair and blue, sinister eyes. Hmm. 
He seemed to appreciate her wants and watch with interest her improvement or decay. His kindness she received and by it was almost won. Her mother wished her to encourage his attentions. She had counted the acres which were to be transmitted to an only son. She knew there was silver in the purse. She would not have Jane too sentimental. The eagerness with which he amassed wealth was repulsive to Jane. He did not spare his person or beasts in its pursuit. She felt that no such a, that she felt that to such a man she should be considered an encumbrance. She doubted if he would desire her if he did not know she would bring a handsome patrimony. Her mother, full in favor with the parents of Henry, commanded her to accept him. Mm. She engaged herself, yielding to her mother's wishes, because she had not strength to oppose them. And sometimes, when witness of her mother's and Mary's tyranny, she felt any change would be preferable, even such a one as this. She knew her husband should be the man of her own selecting, one she was conscious of preferring before all others. She could not say this of Henry. That's sad that her mom is like, he's rich, marry her. You're an invalid. You're not going to do any better. Mm. In this dilemma, a visitor came to Aunt Abby's, one of her boy favorites, George Means, from an adjoining state. Sensible, plain looking, agreeable, talented. He could not long be a stranger to anyone who wished to know him. Jane was accustomed to sit much with Aunt Abby always. Her presence now seemed necessary to assist in entertaining this youthful friend. Jane was more pleased with him each day and silently wished Henry possessed some refinement and the polished manners of George. She felt dissatisfied with her relation to him. His calls while George was there brought their opposing qualities vividly before her, and she found it disagreeable to force herself into those attentions belonging to him. She received him apparently only as a neighbor. George returned home and Jane endeavored to stifle the risings of dissatisfaction and had nearly succeeded when a letter came which needed but one glance to assure her of its birthplace and she retired for its perusal. Well was it for her that her mother's suspicion was not aroused or her curiosity startled to inquire who it came from. After reading it, she glided into Aunt Abby's and placed it in her hands, who was no stranger to Jane's trials. George could not rest after his return, he wrote, until he had communicated to Jane the emotions her presence awakened and his desire to love and possess her as his own. He begged to know if his affections were reciprocated or could be, if she would permit him to write to her, if she was free from all obligation to another. Ooh. Um, how is she going to answer this? Because she is not free from all obligation to another. She is engaged to what's his face, Henry, even though she doesn't want to be. Mm. What would mother say, queried Jane as she received the letter from her aunt? Mm, not much to comfort you. Now, aunt, George is just such a man as I could really love, I think, from all I have seen of him. You know, I never could say that of Henry. Then don't marry him, interrupted Aunt Abby. Mother will make me. Your father won't. Well, aunt, what can I do? Would you answer the letter or not? Yes, answer it. Tell him your situation. I shall not tell him all my feelings. Mm, maybe you should. I don't know. Jane answered that she had enjoyed his company much. She had seen nothing offensive in his manner or appearance, that she was under no obligations which forbade her receiving letters from him as a friend and acquaintance. Intriguing. George was puzzled by the reply. I would have been too. He wrote to Aunt Abby and from her learned all. He could not see Jane thus sacrificed without making an effort to rescue her. Another visit followed. George heard Jane say she preferred him and then conferred with Henry at his home. It was not a pleasant subject to talk upon. Wow, I imagine it wasn't. Can you even imagine some man walks up to you and says, yeah, I know you're engaged to her, but you're no good for her and she wants me. I bet that was not a pleasant conversation. Mm. All right, to be thus supplanted was not to be thought of. He would sacrifice everything but his inheritance to secure his betrothed. Oh, Henry, you would sacrifice everything but your money to have Jane. Aw. 
And so you were the cause of her late coldness towards me. Leave, I will talk no more about it. The business is settled between us, there it will remain, said Henry. The business. <clears throat> Have you no wish to know the real state of Jane's affections towards you? Asked George. No, go, I say go. And Henry opened the door for him to pass out. He retired to Aunt Abby's. Henry soon followed and presented his cause to Mrs. Belmont. Provoked, surprised, indignant, she summoned Jane to her presence and after a lengthy tirade upon Nab and her satanic influence, really? Aunt Abby's influence is satanic? All right. Sorry. And after a lengthy tirade upon Nab and her satanic influence, told her she could not break the bonds which held her to Henry. She should not. George Means was rightly named. He was truly mean enough. She knew his family of old. His father had four wives and five times as many children. Go to your room, Miss Jane, she continued. Don't let me know of your being in nabs for one while. The storm was now visible to all beholders. Mr. Belmont sought Jane. She told him her objections to Henry, showed him George's letter, told her answer, the occasion of the visit. He bade her not make herself sick. He would see that she was not compelled to violate her free choice in so important a transaction. Nice. He then sought the two young men, told them he could not as a father see his child compelled to an uncongenial union. A free voluntary choice was of such importance to one of her health. She must be left free to her own choice. And take one for women everywhere. She must be free. She must be left free to her own choice. Thank you, Harriet E. Wilson. Jane sent Henry a letter of dismission. Mm. I would like to send somebody a letter of dismission. I don't have anybody to send a letter of dismission to, but doesn't that sound like that's fun? Dear John, I am sending you this letter of dismission. Okay, I'm sorry. Jane sent Henry a letter of dismission. He her, one of a, he her one of a legal bearing in which he balanced his disappointment by a few hundreds. Mm. To brave her mother's fury nearly overcame her, but the consolations of a kind father and aunt cheered her on. After a suitable interval, she was married to George and removed to his home in Vermont. Thus, another light disappeared from Nick's horizon. Another was soon to follow. Jack was anxious to try his skill in providing his own support, so a situation as clerk in a store was procured in a western city, and six months after Jane's departure was Nig abandoned to the tender mercies of Mary and her mother. Oh no, poor Fredo. As if to remove the last vestige of earthly joy, Mrs. Belmont sold the companion and pet of Fredo, the dog Fido. Oh, that's the end of chapter five. Life does not look good for Fredo. So that's that for now. Um, we're reading Our Nig by Harriet E. Wilson. I'm Rashonda Cade, and this is Reading with Rashonda.